good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much to Sophie and Daisy for giving me the opportunity to, to talk today. Um, so I'm, well, I'm Olivier, and actually I, I'm a professor of genetics at the University of Nottingham, but this day I've been seconded to the International Livestock uh, Research Institute in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. This is where actually uh, I'm giving this seminar. From what is um, three years ahead from uh, people uh, in the UK. So the topic of today is indigenous, actually, domestic chicken diversity, origin, dispersion, and selection. And in a certain sense, this talk is uh, is a bit biased if we if we take the chicken point of view. I'm going to talk uh, about uh, the, the village chicken, the indigenous village chicken, but I'm not going to talk about the commercial chicken that some of you may be working with, uh, uh, and I will not be talking uh, also, or very briefly only, about the traditional fancy chicken breeds. So when we think about chicken and, and think about diversity, uh, basically, it all started with uh, uh, the domestication and then uh, from wild ancestor, certain wild ancestor, maybe one or several, the domestication could have had multiple times or a single time. And then subsequently, uh, because of the species and because the wild ancestor is still present in uh, many parts of the world, there has been some genetic change. Obviously, from the center of domestication, uh, chicken uh, uh, diffuse uh, uh, to distribute and, and, and travel all across the world. And this really are uh, the beginning, really, for the chicken. And at the beginning, we had what we, I would argue, we had only indigenous village chicken, which today doesn't exist anymore uh, uh, in most of the European country, at least. So the idea of fancy traditional chicken breeds, or breeds in general, in fact, of chicken, is in Europe is really developed in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, in some of other parts of the world, there were already more ancient, what we would call today chicken breed, or at least certain phenotype of chicken, uh, for example, the silky chicken in China, uh, or uh, during the, the Roman Empire, for example, Plumela already described Bantam chicken and uh, uh, compared to the more normal phenotypes. And obviously, as you are all aware, in the 20th century, uh, we talk about essentially the commercial stock, which are three types, boiler, egg layer, and the dual purpose. So the talk is really going to be about indigenous village chicken. Now, when you think about indigenous village chicken, if you want to study indigenous village chicken, you obviously have to sample. This, this, this bird, and, you, and sampling is actually a major component uh, of, uh, of the work that we have been uh, doing in collaboration with uh, uh, many, many institutions. So these are only a few of the people, really, uh, which have been uh, involved in this sampling. And uh, good sampling, proper sampling, and getting samples sometimes in difficult condition, very difficult condition in remote area, is really a challenge. So these people are really need to be acknowledged. And then I would like for this purpose of this talk, I've been interacting with uh, several colleagues and I would like to thank in particular uh, Raman Lawal, which I understand is, is also, uh, attending, and Janine Almatkias, Adriana Valerio Trujillo and Joan Machero. So let's start from the beginning, origin domestication, and let's address the two issues, the ancestral species and the domestication center. Now, the chicken, as you all know, belong to the genus Gallus. And in the genus Gallus, in fact, we have today four species, the red jungle fall, the Ceylon jungle fall, the green jungle fall, and the gray jungle fall. And from the onset, we may be argued that all the four species could have pretended to be the ancestral species of the domestic chicken. Uh, if you look to the morphology of, of, of the domestic birds, but the morphology can be very diverse, they can connect it, I get to 
all of them to some extent, perhaps obviously more to the this one, which is the red jungle form. And these four species have a geographic distribution, which is a distinct geographic, largely distinct geographic distribution. So the red jungle fall one is the one with the largest geographic distribution going from the Indonesian island up to India. The gray jungle fall is rather uh, restricted to uh, the southern part of the Indian Peninsula. The map is not fully correct, in fact, India, and uh, it actually moves slightly more north than what is shown on the map. And there's a region of overlap between the, the Red Jungle Fall and the uh, Red Jungle Fall. The Ceylon or Sri Lanka Jungle Fall is endemic to Sri Lanka, and the Green Jungle Fall is found along the Indonesian island. Now, there are also chicken, which look like red jungle fall in the Philippines, uh, is not mentioned on the map because uh, people believe that they might be a rather feral population than truly wild population. So Darwin actually, uh, in, in his two uh, main, main publications, we had several, in fact, but already on the origin of species publication, mentioned that the likely ancestor of the domestic chicken would be the red jungle. He expands on this idea based on morphology uh, and a behavioral trait. Uh, and he concluded uh, in the, I don't know if you can see that, yes. Yeah. He concluded in, uh, in the 1868 uh, chapter, a relevant chapter in the variation of animal and plants under domestication, that in his opinion, all the breed, all the uh, domestic chicken are probably the descent of Gallus bankiba. Uh, and, but he always, he nevertheless realized that there have been a lot of things happening since then. And that since then, the, uh, since the wild ancestor, there has been a lot of uh, morphological and plumage uh, uh, distinction between the domestic and, and the wild. Now, today, you know the chicken as being Gallus Gallus domesticus, uh, in time of Darwin, uh, it was uh, uh, the wilds. It was not Gallus Gallus, but it was Gallus Bankiba. But later on, the name was replaced with Gallus Gallus simply based on the priority rule of the, the nomenclatures. Now, if you are interested to uh, understand uh, the origin of the chicken and the scent of domestication, uh, obviously, one entry point is uh, archaeology, zooarchaeology, and is the study of, of the chicken bone. However, we do face uh, several problems, or archaeologists face, do face several problems uh, when dealing with uh, chicken bones. First of all, uh, chicken bones are either, well, often we are rare, or they will be in destroyed, or just simply not uh, collected. Uh, in, in most of the archaeological dig digging, uh, for the simple reason that uh, uh, people were uh, initially concentrated more, I guess, on uh, bigger animal like cattle, sheep, and goat. So th that's one of the problems. There are not many. Uh, and when they are, they are uh, actually in often in very bad shape. Another problem is that if you think about the geographic distribution of the chicken, and particularly the one species of chicken, it's overlapped with a lot of other Phasianidae. The chicken belongs to the Phasianidae. Uh, uh, it's a galliform. And so it overlaps with a lot of other species. And so to have distinct criteria which allow you to distinguish between chicken and other species, non gallus species, is actually uh, 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 not easy at all. Nevertheless, uh, there was a study in 2014 uh, who actually uh, suggested that there would have been a center of chicken domestication in northern China. And uh, they based that they found some bones here uh, and uh, uh, basically along the Yellow River, which is obviously a center of agriculture. And they pretended that basically this uh, was a center of, where well, the chicken were present there at uh, uh, quite a long time ago. And, uh, and, and there were the domestic chicken at the time. However, subsequently, uh, this study has been criticized by uh, other studies, actually, and which have challenged uh, 
different things of the study. They challenge basically that the bone identification, uh, the bone they show and the identification of the bone where neck might not have been correct uh, and uh, may correspond to another species. They also challenge, they did some ancient DNA on this work. They also challenge the, the portion of the bacterial DNA which was reported to that as being non-diagnostic. And last but not least, they challenge the, the climate which was unfair to be at the time uh, in that area, the chicken is a tropical species, and, and they say simply it would have been too cold to have a local domestication center. And in fact, in 2020, uh, there was another publication where they reported that, in fact, the bones which are being found in different sites in uh, uh, northern China, uh, uh, in northwest China, are in fact pheasant bones, and that the society, the agricultural society there, were exploiting grain fed pheasant and not sheep. So it appeared that this putative center of domestication, which was proposed on, in 2014, uh, uh, no, it doesn't hold really, and it's probably not correct. So scientists have tried to actually assess uh, the, the, the domestication of the chicken, uh, the scent of domestication of the chicken by looking to mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA have been used uh, very often to look for uh, uh, identification of possible scent of domestication under the hypothesis that basically at the scent of domestication, this is where you will find most of the diversity of the, mit uh, mit of the mitochondrial DNA. Obviously, you have domestication if you have a maternal marker and reproduction in, in captivity. So people look at mitochondrial DNA. And we did that as well. So this is actually, we examined uh, uh, fragments uh, of the D-loop, the highly viable portion of the mitochondrial DNA from more than 5,500 chicken. And what you can see in this, in this slide is a network which has expressed the relationship between the different mitochondrial DNA haplotypes. And you can see typically that you have a central haplotypes uh, uh, from which uh, you have uh, basically haplotype diverging, uh, often by only one base pair difference, sometimes a little bit more. So typically these are uh, actually expansion. A signature, what we call a mitochondrial DNA expansion. And, and, and this is basically what it looks like and, and when you combine all the data from all the different parts of the world. Now, importantly, when you look to the mitochondrial DNA of the chicken, all the mitochondrial DNA of the chicken and uh, uh, in the red jungle fall be, be, belong to the same uh, lineage. So basically, it tells you that obviously on the maternal side, at least, the, uh, uh, the red jungle fall is indeed uh, the, the main ancestor of the chicken. So the next thing, of course, you've got the mitochondrial DNA and then you of the domestic chicken from across the world, and you can compare this mitochondrial DNA with the mitochondrial DNA found in uh, other different subspecies of the jungle fall. So uh, here we have uh, Gallus gallus, Gallus padicus, Jambolet, Bankiva, and Mergi. The jungle fall, the red jungle fall, which is the one with the largest distribution, has in fact five subspecies, okay, which I mentioned here, with different geographic distribution. So we did that, we, we looked, we compared the mitochondrial DNA of uh, uh, the uh, domestic chicken, and we compare with them and, and, and with the one found in um, the subspecies of the red jungle form. And here you have the different color corresponding basically to the color here. And then what you look is basically what share allele, but also uh, allele which may be unique in the uh, mitochondrial DNA of this regular subspecies across the, uh, uh, the different subspecies. So what you observe here when you do that of, is that it's basically what is shown in this slide is that it's actually each, if you want, expansion that you were uh, observing uh, is actually seems to be present in all the species. So it really doesn't help you uh, to, uh, 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 at all, in fact, to pinpoint what could be the subspecies origin of the 
domestic chicken. And in fact, if one thinks it can possibly suggest is that you will not have a one single domestication, but multiple domestication and we subsequently uh, mixed up really. So the breakthrough uh, really knowledge came from a, a recent paper from 2020, published in 2020, where people analyzed 863 genomes, full genome. So we move from a mitochondrial DNA restricted study to a full genome study. And, and in that paper, they had actually, uh, they managed to obtain a very large number of, uh, in red, of sample and to do genome sequencing, a lot of, uh, 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 of the, all the subspecies of Gallus, red jungle forest. They also uh, include uh, some other species, Bayus, the green, Lafayette, the Ceylon, Sri Lanka, Sonerati, the green. And of course, they include the rest. And the first thing that they were able to do using full genome sequencing and, uh, is uh, comparing SNPs across these different subspecies. They showed, the first thing they showed that they largely are actually able to separate all the subspecies. They correspond to different lineage. And of course, that's, that's the first step. Uh, if, you, if you are able to distinguish between the subspecies at the full genome level, which we were not able to do uh, using mitochondrial DNA, it's obviously a, a first major advance here. And they show that, in fact, the time seems to the most common recent ancestor, the Quincy subspecies is between 50,000 to 125,000 uh, years, uh, years ago. Sorry. No. So that was the first thing. Sorry. So that they were able to show thanks to a large data set. Now, the next thing they did compare then where all the domestic chicken fit in terms when you're doing principal component analysis with the other subspecies. And what they observed here is that in fact, it is a single subspecies, Gallus gallus padicus, which is actually, which is the closest to all the domestic chicken from Asia that they analyze. You can see that in the red here and so on. So clearly, Using this, this evidence plus some other evidence based on actually a, a mixture and ancestry in the genome, they, they then propose which, uh, that in fact there has been a single sorry, domestication center, uh, 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 which is actually uh, in the area which is occupied today by Gallus Gallus padiceus and which contains around Myanmar, Southern China, and Northern Thailand. So it appeared from the study, they actually show it quite convincingly. If you haven't read the paper, I recommend that you read, that in fact, uh, the sample that they examine, uh, all the sample they examine on the other, uh, in their study, they originate, the domestic chicken originate from a single geographic area of uh, domestication. Uh, and from Gallus gallus padiceus, the, the subspecies of red jungle form. They also calculated uh, the, the time of domestication of the chicken, which they uh, proposed and it happened 9,500 to 3,300 years ago, which is similar to the work that we, we had published uh, slightly early, around 8,000 years ago, which obviously corresponds to the Neolithic time, which is all the then, uh, in fact, the first archaeological remain of domestic chicken, but of course, it's not impossible that, well, given the, the interval, but also, uh, obviously, uh, the record, the archaeological record may be incomplete. So we need to, to see what the future would, would tell us there. Now, so you have the domestication. Now, what's happened next? So, Obviously, domestic chicken now are found everywhere. So what's happened next in terms of distribution? What's happened next in terms of uh, 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 movement uh, and dispersion of the chicken? And here, uh, uh, this, uh, I would like to distinguish between two things. The distribution, the dispersion, I should say, of the chicken within the geographic range of the jungle fall and the dispersion of the chicken 
out of the geographic range of the gender. So in their study, they were able to show, in fact, that from the center of domestication, chicken move around. But while moving around, they actually uh, crossbred with, uh, with the other subspecies. So in fact, if you look today to the domestic chicken from South Asia here, in this part, in this part of the world, they contain between 3.8 to 22.4 percent of their genome coming from this subspecies, Carus carus murphy. It contains a majority of the genome is Carus carus padicus, but it also has a genome, uh, a proportion of the genome which will vary from one population to the other, uh, uh, which is coming from Carus carus murphy. The Indonesian chicken similarly got actually a certain portion of the genome which is coming from Gallus gallus bankiva, a subspecies living in, in Indonesia, as well as Gallus gallus, uh, which is uh, a species uh, in Thailand, Thailand, Malaysia, etc., which actually is, was on the way towards uh, um, uh, Indonesia. And similarly, the Chinese chicken, uh, they have a certain proportion of Gallus gallus jamboli uh, uh, genome backgrounds. Now, but what about oops, the other species? So what's happening for the other gender four species about virus, Lafayette, uh, and, and, and Sonerati? In these three areas where these wild species are still living, we do find domestic chicken. So did any introgression happen there? What is any crossbreeding or a mixture with this other species? And the most, uh, uh, and in fact, this issue of a mixture, uh, an integration from other uh, four, four species is something which has, I may say, occupied the mind of people for some time. Moregion in, in 1968 actually already uh, did in captive breeding, try to cross green and red, the green jungle four and the red jungle four, and he obtained a certain number of birds, not many, uh, which actually survive and up to the uh, adult age. So clearly, uh, the barrier, the, the, while there is a, the fitness of the bird may not be as one of the person, the species barrier is not complete. So in fact, all F1 hybrids have, have been obtained from cross, from autumn to go for species. Uh, you try hard in captivity, it seems to know late it will work. And I should also mention that uh, there is a cross in Indonesia, which, uh, um, which where people are actually crossing male uh, F1, uh, actually crossing male chicken, rooster jungle, jungle four with domestic hen, and uh, for obtaining a male F1 chicken. As this male is called the Bekizal, and uh, they do that uh, because uh, they. Uh, the hybrid seems to be uh, a, a very special call. And uh, if you have a chance to, to go to Indonesia, you will have the opportunity to listen to a uh, crowing competition and Bekiza that they value for his booty, but also value for, for the call of the Bekiza is uh, the reason uh, why they do that kind of crosses. Now, the next work really was a. Uh, uh, a publication which was we came up in 2008 and and in that publication really that was the first evidence that uh, uh, you had introgression from another species to gray into the red jungle fall and by the extension uh, into the domestic chicken and there they identified that the yellow skin phenotype that you have in some of the chicken breeds are actually uh, coming from the introgression from a, a region of the gene, which it contained the BCDO2, which is a, 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 the beta-carotene dioxinase 2 uh, uh, protein, they identified that this is the result of the introgression. And that was the first genetic, if you want, uh, DNA evidence uh, that there has been integration in gray into domestic and, 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 and so on. So, but curiously, it, it was the only evidence until actually a recent work uh, 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 by my colleague 
uh, Raman Lawal in 2020, which was published in 2020, which is up to now probably the largest study which, uh, which have examined the large number of uh, birds for evidence of uh, integration from uh, other garu species into domestic chicken. Now, the first thing to, to remember is what about the phylogeny of the genus Gallus? Now, this tree represents the phylogeny uh, uh, within the genus Gallus. So what we have here is in blue, the domestic. In red, you have a uh, red jungle fall from different subspecies, which are actually basal in terms of the diversity. This is a genome uh, tree based on SNPs, uh, which are basal to the uh, domestic chicken. In gray is the gray jungle form. Purple is the Ceylon jungle form. Green is the uh, green jungle form. And the black here actually is the pheasant as no groups. Now the, the little uh, here, star blue, light blue are in fact uh, Gallus Gallus bankiva, so one of the subspecies uh, of uh, 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 domestic chicken, but Gallus Gallus bankiva uh, 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 has been, uh, as we have seen, uh, while he has contributed a little bit in some chicken from the Indonesian island, didn't really contribute to all in other parts of the world. And in fact, the Gallus Gallus bankiva uh, diverge uh, from uh, uh, the other subspecies of red jungle fall, at least half a million, if, uh, between half a million and one million uh, years ago. So anyway, so we have the domestic, we have the, the red at uh, uh, the base of the lineage, and then uh, uh, the gray, uh, the Ceylon jungle fall, and the green jungle fall. So what, what Lawal did, uh, Lawal did act, apply actually a, a, a methodology uh, called the Abba Baba method and the D statistic to identify a candidate region of uh, uh, introgression, which may have happened between domestic chicken uh, and um, these other gallus species. And then what he did, he actually built a tree of appetite for this region. Now, obviously, if you have introgression uh, into, uh, if the introgress uh, gray in domestic chicken and red jungle form, you would expect that the upper type of the gray will be actually with the, uh, uh, in the same, if you want, uh, lineage than the upper type of the domestic and uh, 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 the red. So it is exactly what we observe here. No, we have the gray and the Lafayette, which are close together, uh, like it is expected uh, in, in, in the uh, full genome tree, they are sister species. But when you look now on that specific region, you find out that also you do have a set in some upper type, some of the upper type of the domestic chicken examined, which are actually uh, are also present uh, here. Uh, next to the grid. So these are evidence of introversion. And uh, similarly, uh, we do have the same here, introversion into domestic chicken. As for the uh, green jungle fall into domestic chicken, we, uh, in this study, uh, Lawal only identified a single region of, uh, of introversion in the lunch on the chicken. Right, so you have introversion, but it has to be said that it's ex relatively, well, it's rare, it's a rare event. Perhaps the most common event that we detected is actually uh, introgression of region of the fall into uh, domestic chicken. But otherwise, for the other species, for uh, the Sri Lanka, Ceylon jungle fall and green jungle fall in particular, it's extremely rare. And what we have here is that the presence of this introgression uh, uh, will depend on the geography that you are looking for. Obviously, if you look, for example, uh, uh, to the chicken from Indonesia, you, you find, you don't find, in fact, introgression from the gray, obviously. Uh, if you look uh, with the, or the opposite, if you look for the chicken from Saudi Arabia and Ethiopia, you do find relatively frequent, uh, frequently introgression from the gray. And for the introgression from the Ceylon, it is limited to the Sri Lanka chicken. 
And this makes sense, of course, uh, in this respect. Now, the next question, of course, you have to ask yourself, hey, what is the importance of this introversion in the shaping of the diversity of the domestic chicken? And the yellow skin gene, the yellow skin phenotype is the only example that we are aware so far that such introversion would have actually lead to uh, 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 specific uh, phenotypes. But when you look at the chicken, and see, these are some of the uh, photographs of the fancy chicken, when you look at this fancy chicken, you realize that in fact, the diversity is huge. So it's a little bit tempting to assume that perhaps some of this introversion may be at the basis uh, of uh, uh, some of the interesting phenotypes that we observe among uh, the chicken. But I have to say this is purely hypothetical. It is also quite possible that we are dealing with regular, regulatory sequence, which may be in, in progress, and which obviously will, uh, uh, may have an effect on, on this figure. OK, so this is in, uh, 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 basically happening within the uh, geographic distribution of the uh, species in Asia. So what about outside Asia? And of course, chicken move in two ways, by trading and by moving with uh, um, uh, actual people. Now, if we go back to mitochondrial DNA and we start to look where do we find specifically this different expansion. And, and, and in fact, you realize that all these different haplogroups, as uh, the different color here, are not present everywhere outside uh, the uh, wild jungle fall geographic distribution. It seems to be uh, more, some more present in Africa and Europe for the, this one, we call the yellow one the D, this one is limited to U1, and this one is Myanmar and so on. Now, today there has been no study uh, which have been examining the full genome uh, of uh, uh, non-Asian chicken to find out uh, if that can help uh, to reconstruct uh, uh, the history of dispersion of the chicken. The genome are there, but the analysis is still need to be done. But mitochondrial DNA has been uh, uh, investigated in this respect. And I want just to give you two examples. Uh, the example of the African continent and uh, the link between Sri Lanka and, and, and China. Now, in the example of the African continent, which is, uh, I guess, my favorite continent, uh, what we can say is that the earliest chicken, really, on the African continent is actually a, depict, a de depiction of a rooster, which comes from the Tutankhamun tombs, and uh, in which date from uh, around uh, uh, 1425 BC. That's for a description. No, for the bones, the older one, actually evidence for bones, are actually found in Ethiopia, uh, uh, in the Tigray region, and date from pre axumic times. If you see on this map, you, you will see that, in fact, if you look for the eastern part of the African continent, chicken are relatively uh, uh, quite a newcomer. Uh, sorry, they are blue here. And there is no evidence uh, uh, of uh, chicken early uh, on that uh, part of the world that around the end or after the end of the first millennium. And in fact, there's an interesting paper which actually uh, detailed that a lot and support a late first millennium introduction of domestic chicken, but equally uh, of, the, of the black rat. So we looked at two haplogroups, uh, uh, the, the yellow one, and this is the most common one, and uh, so what you can see is, is distributed everywhere, but it's also distributed quite largely on the African continent. And in fact, on the African continent, you do find two main upper groups of mitochondrial daily. The blue one or the yellow one, if you want, are upper group A and upper group D, uh, as we call it. But this upper group here but is only found, or largely only found, there are some data there in Ethiopia now, but largely only found on the eastern part, on the, uh, and not found on the opposite of, of the yellow one area. So what we have here is that then we probably had in Africa two waves of introduction. Of chicken. One which was most likely was terrestrial, mainly terrestrial. It probably started from the Indian subcontinent and may have followed a different route to the Horn of Africa here, yeah? may have entered the continent, or to the north of the African continent and dispersed. And the second one is actually the second wave, which is 
along with one entry point along coastal East Africa, which started much later and originated probably around the Indonesian island. And it may have been linked to, uh, to the Austronesian expansion and, and, and trading network. Uh, with, however, one point to mention, there is no evidence of a direct introduction from Indonesia to Madagascar of chicken. Rather, all the evidence are pointing out, including linguistic evidence, that the chicken from Madagascar, genetic, linguistic, etc., that the chicken from Madagascar originate from the eastern part of the country. The second example I want to give you is the case of Sri Lanka. Now, Sri Lanka, if you look to the diversity of Sri Lanka, you find actually a very large diversity in terms of mitochondrial DNA. And you have to remember that in history, Sri Lanka was a trading center, obviously, a, a sort of a meeting point between uh, Europe, South Asia, and China. And these people were traveling, and they were traveling with chicken. And so perhaps not surprisingly, you find quite a large diversity of chicken uh, in, in this part of the world. You do find also a very large diversity uh, uh, in another place called the Yunnan province in China, which is actually very close or even but possibly part of the center of domestication. So you have diversity in the trading crossroad area and diversity in the domestication geographic area. So if we look now the distribution of one specific haplogroups, what we do observe here, and that's a very, a very interesting, obviously it's a window, a modern window, so uh, we have always to be careful of the way we interpret the past uh, based on, on observation from today. But nevertheless, we do observe that in fact, this pink group is present essentially in two parts of the world, in the Yunnan province and in Sri Lanka. There's also an interesting example in Africa, but let's forget that for the time being. So what's going on here? Or can you have an upper group which is only present here and here uh, and not present anywhere else? And in fact, this is actually will fit quite well uh, with, with actually there was a maritime silk road during the, uh, uh, the Han Dynasty. So what you can see is that there was a, a direct trading road which were actually joining uh, 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 China, uh, uh, southwestern China to Sri Lanka. And it's possible uh, that in fact the presence of this uh, pink upper group uh, uh, in uh, Sri Lanka is the result of this uh, ancient maritime trading Silk Road. Okay, we talk about uh, around 2000 years ago. Right, the next part of the, of the talk is about environmental adaptation, selection. So again, I'm going to talk about the indigenous chicken. So if you look for Chicken, obviously this map represents the chicken density all across the world. You basically have chicken everywhere. And if you look at the agroecology, you realize that of course the distribution of the chicken will actually uh, overlay a, a huge diversity of agroecology. Agroecology means of course different environment, different uh, 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 habitat. So we decide to examine uh, 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 the to find out, well, we to investigate, I should say. We decided to investigate uh, basically the adaptation of local chicken uh, uh, under different agroecology. So this paper is for, for the moment in, in the review. So uh, I put the link uh, for the, uh, in bioarchive. And basically what we decided to try to do is to say, okay, let's try it if we can understand through uh, uh, a characterization of this different environment, if we can understand uh, the local adaptation of indigenous, indigenous village chicken. Now, the title of paper is about uh, integrated environmental and genomic analysis reveal the tribal local adaptation in African indigenous chicken. But in fact, we concentrate on one country, which is the one where I, um, I am currently, Ethiopia. Why Ethiopia? Because in fact, in a certain sense, Ethiopia in a single country is uh, a summary, I would say, of all agroecology that you may find on the African continent. Because Ethiopia is a very diverse country in terms of agroecology. It's a country which basically you can have maintained up to uh, uh, above sea level 4,500 meters of altitude, but also it's an area uh, of the planet where you can uh, go below sea level 
uh, uh, in the Galactic Depression and minus one point five meter. And of course, between the two, you have a uh, 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 huge diversity uh, of environments because of the topology of the country and on a very small uh, issue and geographic distance between between points. So we decide to use uh, an ecological niche model to actually first characterize uh, the environment. Obviously, if you want to characterize the environment, which is uh, your selection pressure here, <clears throat> it's quite a complex matter. The environment is obviously uh, an interaction of many different parameters uh, of uh, and many different variables. So the challenge is, of course, to identify which are the key variable parameter, which may be the main driver of selection. So what we did is, uh, first thing we did is actually, we collected data on uh, 34 climatic and environmental variables. These are all available now uh, freely online. It includes climatic variable, uh, soil variable, and vegetation variable. So, uh, and then we actually sampled 25 populations and we genome sequenced 245 birds, living in different altitudes, different agriculture. And the first thing we noticed, which was good for us, is that apart two population, this population, despite living in different agroecology, are genetically quite similar. These two populations are distinct. They actually live in, on the uh, edge of the Rift Valley, and they have a different history, but I don't have time to talk about that. But the majority of our birds are actually uh, uh, quite genetically close. Oh, Olivia. Yes? Uh, if I may ask, so these two, four, five uh, birds, do they span across the entire geography of Ethiopia, or there are some uh, locations that are not included in this sample? Well, the locations which are not included, because of course, if you go there, it's a, the Somalia region, uh, uh, it's close to Somalia, well, chicken are not common there, and, and, and we couldn't do something there for security reasons. So this bird were basically the main, there's also part in Sudan where, which we, we, we couldn't go again for security reason. Uh, so, uh, but we did Tigray, uh, the Tigray region, which is actually where it started, at which today will be uh, not accessible. Uh, so most of the region where we could go are represented there. And as you will see, in fact, uh, when we actually analyze uh, and we do a ecological niche modeling, what we, we identify a set of eight, well, actually initially six, eight, and then it was reduced to six main environmental parameter, which explain the diversity of the environment where this chicken live. And in fact, what we, what we, what we able to do is to group these different population in different ecotypes. And what you have in C here is actually what we call environmental suitability map. In other words, if you look, the more red you are, and in fact, if the slide is, doesn't, allow, doesn't allow to you to see, but if you look to the, the red, there's also a, 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 a dead, a, a, I should say, a, a dark dot there. So, and what you identify in this dark dot is that actually this is a point of sampling, but, but you have to be careful. It's not the dots here that correspond to a lake, but there's another dot there that you cannot see. And then in fact, the more red you are, the more, the more is your environment similar to where you did the sampling. And so by doing that, by this uh, environmental suitability map, you can see that in terms of environment, you clearly have difference. You have this population here, this population here, you have this uh, population here. Clearly there are different ecotypes there. And in fact, what we are defining here is different ecotype and we have uh, actually defined eight to 12 different ecotypes. Then what we did, uh, we ran the population for, the, uh, uh, for each main variable. Uh, that means this six variable here. And we did a signature selection analysis contrasting the, the, the population. And then 
Obviously, we use different methods of signature selection analysis, and this is just to give you an example. Uh, but what is interesting to note is that when you examine different ecotypes, often we identify signal, not too many, but a few signal, and they often involve cluster of candidate gene, which may be related to a environmental local adaptation. And this is one of the example here, which is basically for minimum temperature. Now, temperature, where is the minimum temperature in Ethiopia? But temperature is often in a high altitude. So obviously, uh, it's, it's, we have to be clear here. That if you want to live in a uh, high altitude in Ethiopia, you will have to face different challenge. You will have to face the, the fact that the cold temperature, you will have to face the uh, uh, hypoxia, well, the lack of oxygen, okay, and 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 oh, so you will have to have different uh, and eventually high reform pattern as well. So what is interesting about uh, uh, the finding is that by finding cluster of gene which correspond to signature selection, it may be a way that the birds may uh, selection of this cluster may be actually allow the bird to cope with different environmental challenge with gene in the same cluster uh, having slightly, uh, having different, different function. Okay, and as this paper is still under review and so on, so in, in, uh, our conclusion may be still changing, I'm going to stop here, so thank you very much. <laughs>